it's it's very very common in the Muslim community where people uh, and uh, you know have a list of questions that either have to do with Islamic law or have to do with Islamic history or have to do with the Sira. Uh, you know, what happened in this battle and what, what happened with the, uh, the issue of, of concubines or, or uh, uh, enslavement at war and, and things like that. And they they demand a response. Now, of course, the psychological dynamics here are fascinating. On the one hand, it is, I, I've received many messages like this in the past, and I have very strong suspicions that the messages are actually not by a Muslim at all, but by an Islamophobe. And uh, they, they do this as a way of um, challenging you. Um, and especially the ones that sound very angry. But even if they are indeed by Muslims and non-Islamophobes pretending to be Muslims, it, it, notice that this type of sociological dynamic where a person has a set of questions about historical events or a set of questions about legal issues and the these questions become an impediment to faith. And it's not just that they are impediment to faith, but they are an impediment to identity. So their, their, their identity, their sense of being as a Muslim is undermined and greatly weakened uh, because of questions that they think are very difficult to answer. And if you think of, of um, how often do you encounter the same dynamic in the world of Judaism or the world of Christianity? Although a real student of, I mean, this, you could have the same uh, um, uh, um, flood of questions about any tradition. It depends on what you what you're looking for, and what type of data were you exposed to. Especially if you don't have mastery over the 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 mechanics of data. It, it is far more common in the Islamic context. And then it is, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that because we are a defeated people, because we are, we are a people whose law and whose theology and whose history is colonized, thoroughly colonized, even the questions that we ask about our tradition are not our own. And the, 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 um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Not, it's not arrogance, but beyond arrogance, something between arrogance and insolence. The presumptuousness, maybe, that we feel comfortable in demanding responses to intellectual issues that are far beyond what we are positioned to actually investigate or research or study. The reductionism by which we deal with the Islamic tradition, it, it takes a great deal of presumptuousness. It takes a great deal of arrogance. 
how do you get this arrogant attitude towards a tradition? You get that arrogant attitude towards a tradition if you are conditioned to see this tradition in a diminutive fashion. So if you are conditioned, for instance, to think of the Jewish tradition and think to yourself, oh, well, you know, Jewish history is very complicated and there is a lot of scholarship out there and I cannot really ask a question uh, without, it's sort of, you are conditioned to think in terms of, if I have a question about Jewish history or I have a, I have a question about Jewish law, I don't dare speculate about anything unless I deal with the enormous corpus of intellectual production within the Jewish tradition about these questions. So what you're conditioned to do is a level of humility and a level of intellectual refrain an intellectual restraint because you are conditioned to think about a tradition as complicated, nuanced, layered, and so the whole dynamic of pop questions and pop answers is it, 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 something that you don't even get into, you don't fall into because of the fact that you are conditioned of thinking of a tradition as complicated and conditioned to have a level of humility vis-a-vis -vis that tradition. In colonized traditions, there is a reductionism. People are not conditioned to think that that tradition is complex or nuanced or multi-layered or multi-faceted, but in fact are conditioned to think that this is a tradition of a simplistic people who produce simplistic questions, who engage in simplistic historical dynamics. That stereotyping of a tradition is, is quintessentially what a colonized tradition becomes. You, you dumb down. So questions of law, by their very nature, are extremely complex because there, there are, it's not God speaking that tells us here is all the law, but you are talking about human interpreters that engaged in very complex dynamics to produce a discursive juristic tradition. Similarly, questions of history, even a question like what happened in the Battle of Hunain with the prisoners of war? Profoundly complex questions that are not open to simplistic black and white responses. The fact that every average Muslim grows up thinking that they can pose easy questions about the seerah and receive easy answers about the seerah or about anything in Islamic history or about anything in Islamic law is exactly the fingerprint of a colonized tradition. So these people, I mean, I, I dealt with part of this in the khutbah, but, but it is so critical because it is one of the core messages that I want to leave before leaving this world because I see it as a monumental intellectual issue that the, the, the questions we ask 
we have become conditioned through colonialism, through Islamophobia, through power dynamics, to think that we're being critical, question, uh, critical thinkers. We're being deep thinkers. When we say something like, what happened in the Battle of Hunayn? But the way we ask the question and the way we expect the response, black or white, in a dichotomous fashion, is actually evidence of anything but critical or analytical thinking. It, what we are, the, 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 the theater of it is that we are being dumb, asking dumb questions, receiving dumb answers, and the entire dynamic of Islamicity becomes a dumb, dumb, thoroughly anti-intellectual dynamic. Core part of being a Muslim is having a sense of awe and humility as how grand and enormous and nuanced the tradition to which you belong is. That you have a sense of deep reverence about, I belong to a tradition in which any question I ask about Islamic law and any question I ask about Islamic history will require years and years and years of study and having the humility of saying, and it should be. It's not, you don't feel cheated by that. In fact, you feel vindicated by that. But this is so far, I mean, you find this all the time among Jewish students of Jewish history or Jewish law. You find this all the time among serious students of Christian history. Canon law, people don't even ask questions about canon law anymore. I mean, it, it, except for a very small select group. But I've even found it among Hindu students or Buddhist students, the, the, the intuitive awareness that if I make a generalization about my own tradition, all I'm doing is I'm proving how ignorant I am. It is completely absent in the Islamic context. That, that awareness that if I generalize about the seerah, or if I just shoot off my mouth about what happened to the prisoners of war in the Battle of Qunayn, which you know we can we can talk about. It will take us about six hours to just ask the relevant questions, review the relevant sources of information, and develop some type of methodology for this course before we can start having a serious conversation just about that one simple issue. Um, Subhanallah. This is precisely where something like al-Hikam al-Ata'iyah comes in. Because if we raised our children with the awareness that if you want to ask questions about history, then do, the home, do your homework and understand that asking the intelligent, relevant question is, in fact, a truly challenging dynamic. Same thing about history or law. 